the Victorian era was a time of great class divide between rich and poor, the haves and have-nots, while the working class and poor struggled long hours to pay the cost of their lodgings, food and clothing, what were the rich doing with their money? The poor laboured to survive, but wealthy aristocrats and landowners lived a life of plenty, enjoying lavish parties and banquets, with no expense spared on food, wine and entertainment. High society was ignorant to the plight of the poor, for there was a belief among the upper classes that poverty was the cause of idleness and immorality, and that their way out of poverty was through hard work and education. So, the rich carried on spending and partying. Today, you will hear an early Victorian journalist's account of the lavish excess and profligacy of 19th century London's rich in 1842. Find out how a fashionable family could spend as much money on a party as it would cost to feed thousands of London's poor, and how the wealthy thought nothing of furnishing their homes at outrageous expense, whilst at the same time the lower classes struggled to feed themselves, crowded into miserable hovels that lacked even windows, let alone the most humble chair or table of any kind. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. Please check out the description to see how you can support the channel and the content we make. All the varied phases of human life are to be witnessed in the metropolis, the extremes of riches and poverty, of luxurious living and the want of the necessaries of life are hourly exhibited in London in more marked contrast, perhaps, than in any other place in the world. Little do those in the more fashionable parts of the metropolis who have been nursed in the lap of opulence and been always surrounded with a profusion of the luxuries of life, little do they know the deep distress endured by the myriads of the lower classes in the central and eastern districts. It were a curious and not unimportant exercise to inquire into the modes and means of living which obtain in the higher and humbler classes of metropolitan society. Of course, the expenditure of aristocratic families varies with the circumstances and habits of the respective heads of those families, but if I were to express an opinion as to the average annual expenditure of each of the 2,000 or 3,000 titled families who live in London, that opinion would be that such average expenditure is about £12,000. I have often thought that if the sum thus yearly dissipated on the follies and extravagancies of one family were judiciously distributed among the poorer classes of our metropolitan population, how vast would be the aggregate amount of happiness of which it would be productive? Supposing, for example, it were divided into sums of ten pounds, and that that amount were given to as many families as there are twelve pounds in twelve thousand pounds. The benefaction would raise no fewer than one thousand families at present enduring all the horrors of want to a condition of comparative comfort. But the supposititious case ought not to end here. Let us farther suppose that each of the opulent aristocratic families in the metropolis were to put their twelve thousand pounds into one common fund for the relief of the destitute part of the population, and assuming the number of these families to be two thousand five hundred, which is the intermediate number between the two thousand and three thousand, the entire sum thus annually available for the purposes charity and mercy would be three million pounds, and would, on the foregoing calculation of allowing twelve pounds per annum to every poor family, relieve the wants of and raise to a state of comparative competence no fewer than two hundred and fifty thousand or a quarter of a million of families. In fact, it would entirely banish want and poverty from the metropolis, and leave an ample competence for the aristocratic families themselves. There would not be an individual in London who would then know what it is to suffer the privations of any of the necessaries of life. Though at the present period, which is one of peculiar distress, there are perhaps fifty thousand persons who rise every day without knowing by what means, if at all, they are to get a dinner, and though in ordinary circumstances the numbers of such persons is about twenty-five thousand. 
It is painful to think that the aristocracy should feel so little sympathy with the fate of the suffering poor. If they were only to sympathize with those of their fellow creatures in London, who are doomed to struggle with privations which almost overmaster their powers of endurance, they could never bring themselves to expend such immense sums in mere folly and display, while thousands and tens of thousands of those around them are suffering all the horrors of the deepest poverty. I know instances in which fashionable families in the West End expend five hundred pounds on a single route. Has it never occurred to these persons that, had this sum been judiciously expended on the famishing poor, it would have provided a plenteous and healthful meal, assuming the expense of such meal to be sixpence, on no fewer than twenty thousand out of the fifty thousand already referred to as rising every morning from their beds without knowing where they are to procure a meal, or whether one is to be procured at all? I wish this culpable extravagance were confined to persons moving in aristocratic circles. It prevails, unhappily, to a very great extent among persons in the middle ranks of life. Many of our metropolitan professional men, physicians, lawyers, and others, live at the rate of three thousand pounds to four thousand pounds per annum, while thousands of our city merchants and other tradesmen expend twice that sum. Even some of our literary men, ambitious of aping the manners and expenditure of the great, are in the habit of giving occasional dinners, the cost of which varies from seventy pounds to one hundred pounds. One instance of a dinner lately given by a literary gentleman to a party of his friends came under my notice the expenses of which amounted to upwards of one hundred and twenty-five pounds. Such extravagance is, in any case, foolish as well as at variance with right feeling. In the case of literary men it is especially so, for few of them are in circumstances to afford it, or if they be this year, their pecuniary affairs may be in a very different position next year. Of all professions, that of literature is the most precarious. The annals of modern literature are crowded with most painful illustrations of the truth of these observations, but having in one of my former works adverted at some length to the subject, I will not re-enter upon it in this place. The extravagance which prevails among the middle classes is not perhaps so strikingly seen in anything as in the costliness of their furniture. The late Mr. Hope, author of Anastasius furnished his residence at the enormous expense, including his pictures, of three hundred thousand pounds. Of the men of the present day, not claiming aristocratic connections, there is none so celebrated for the indulgence of an expensive taste in furniture as Mr. Broadwood, the brewer, son of the late Mr. Broadwood, the eminent piano forte maker. The former gentleman, who it ought to be mentioned is a bachelor, and only keeps a suit of chambers in the Albany, Burlington Street, is said to have a collection of antique furniture in his drawing-room alone, which costs upwards of fifteen thousand pounds. I have been assured, but cannot vouch for the accuracy of the statement, that Mr. Broadwood has several of the chairs which actually belong to Louis the Fourteenth, for each of which he is represented to have given nearly two hundred pounds. To this fact I can pledge myself that our English tradesmen often go over to France and outbid at auctions of splendid and expensive furniture not only the nobility, but the royalty itself of that country. Only a few months have elapsed since an auctioneer residing in Oxford Street brought over from Paris a magnificent table, for which he gave the sum of one thousand pounds, Louis Philippe having been the next highest bidder for the valuable article. It is painful to turn our thoughts from the luxurious living which obtains among the higher, and to a great extent among the middle, classes of society, to the contemplation of the miserable living which prevails among the lower classes. Myriads of the latter grope and grovel in families of from seven to fourteen, in miserable hovels, many of them underneath the ground, without grates, without glass windows, or indeed windows of any kind the only light and air being admitted through the horizontal door. Here amidst damp and filth and without a breath of fresh air, from one year's end to the other, do whole families mess together as if they were so many pigs. St. Giles's, the neighbourhood of Drury Lane, St. George's in the fields, 
and immense districts in the eastern parts of the metropolis are among the localities in which these appalling scenes are to be witnessed, and the wretchedness of the huts or hovels of which I refer is greatly aggravated by the deplorable destitution of the unhappy inmates as regards food and clothing. The quantities of food on which thousands of them subsist are incredibly small. Sometimes a whole family consisting of from five to ten individuals are compelled to live, if living it can be called, on an amount of food which would not more than suffice for a hearty meal for a person possessing an ordinary appetite, while, in the article of apparel, they have scarcely enough wherewith to cover their nakedness. It is singular that amid the many enterprises of benevolence, which not only owe their origin to metropolitan philanthropy, but aim at the amelioration of the condition of our London population, no association should exist for inquiring into the extent of the frightful evils to which I refer, and providing a remedy for them. The great mass of the metropolitan community are as ignorant of the destitution and distress which prevail in large districts of London, and not at seasons of commercial pressure only, but every year and all the year through.